This is the Bush Electronic Digital Technology Kit, model 2075. It's one of a number of electronic kits produced by the Bush Company in West Germany throughout the 1970s and 1980s. The model 2075 is an introduction to computer technology, and the kit contains 15 interesting experiments, including 1-bit memory, a programmable counter, and experiments with the 7-segment display. If you have the Electronic Studio 2070 model, you can add this kit to conduct an additional 15 interesting experiments. As the 2075 kit was available over several years, there are at least three different packages available for this kit. In front of us we have the box from the 1980s, however there was an earlier version of the box from the 1970s, as well as a special edition of the box using ELO's cyan blue colour to more strongly highlight the association between ELO magazine and these Bush electronic kits. I purchased this kit around a year ago from a German seller, and it was part of a bundle of electronic kits from Bush. That bundle included the Bush Microtronic 2090 kit, which I successfully reverse engineered with the help of a few colleagues of mine. If you'd like to learn more about our efforts to reverse engineer the Bush Microtronic 2090 computer system, I will provide some links to some videos, documentation, and other resources we've gathered during that process in the video description below. But without further ado, let's take a closer look at the Digital Technology 2075 kit. As we can see, the kit contains a nice large printed manual to walk you through all of the experiments included. If we take a quick flick through, we can see that for each experiment there is a schematic, a board layout diagram, as well as these nice illustrations to make the text more understandable and approachable. At the back of the manual there are some advertisements for related kits, including the aforementioned Bush Microtronic. There is the Studio Center, which would have been the main component that you could add this onto as well as a few other kits that were available around that time. I think there are some interesting ones here that allow you to add your own components into the board using these plug-in boards, as well as your own ICs using this IC adapter. There is of course an order list here allowing you to order those parts, as well as a leaflet here inviting you to subscribe to ELO magazine. The kit is based around plug-in modules that plug into these plastic baseboards. The baseboards don't provide any electrical connection, but allow us to plug various modules and components directly into them for alignment. To connect components together, we would use a wire and poke them in these small riveted holes and affix them using these plastic plugs. We'll take a closer look at this approach when we build some circuits later in the video. It is worth reflecting on the distinctiveness of the approach taken by Bush here. By placing the components on individual modules and allowing them to be moved around the baseboard, the circuit can be laid out logically, but still connected using short pieces of wire. We can compare this approach with that used by Radio Shack for its science fair kits in the United States. Here we have spring terminals and short pieces of wire to connect the components, but the fixed layout of those components means that the schematic bears little resemblance to the circuit you eventually assemble. We could also compare this to the Denshi block system popularized by the Gakken Company of Japan. Here, each of the components are embedded inside a small plastic block with metal terminals on each of the sides. This allows the assembled circuit to bear a resemblance to the schematic diagram in the manual. Unfortunately, it does mean there are a few flying wires leading off some of the components to allow certain connections to be made, which are superfluous in individual circuits, as well as requiring significant numbers of these wire link blocks to allow us to connect the individual components together. As you can see, the kit contains a fairly small number of components. We have a battery holder for a PP3 9 volt battery, and I have a Duracell available just here. We have a button. We have two 1 kilo ohm resistors. We have an LED, a 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitor, a 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, an IC gate, and an IC counter. As mentioned, the kit contains some connecting wires which have been stored in this plastic container by the previous owner. We have the plastic plugs which trap the connecting wires against the rivets in each of the component modules. And we also have this useful tool that allows us to easily remove stubborn modules from the plastic baseboard. 
Returning to the ICs, this gate module here is actually a 7400 series quad 2 input NAND gate. This particular kit includes a DM7400 quad 2 input NAND gate by National Semiconductor. And this unit is entirely interchangeable with Texas Instruments 7400 quad 2 input NAND gate. And in fact, some kits you will see will include a Texas Instruments version of this chip. The counter module here is the Texas Instruments SN74143. This chip is one of the more complicated examples from the 7400 series of logic chips. And in fact, this one is a 4-bit BCD counter and latch with a 7-segment LED driver. The module here includes that 7-segment LED display for output, as well as a 5-volt regulator that steps down the 9-volt from the PP3 battery to the 5-volt suitable for both of the ICs in this kit. As we saw, the kit includes this nice large printed manual explaining all of the experiments in the kit. Unfortunately, my German really isn't up to snuff, so I went ahead and took a scan of the manual and have run this through a translator, so I now have an English language version to refer to. The manual starts off with some basics about electricity, and if we look here, we can see some details, and this is nicely illustrated at the bottom, that with electricity, we hear nothing, see nothing, and smell nothing, but we can indeed feel it. And in fact, the manual suggests that the child should lick the PP3 battery to see if they can feel the electric current. I'm not going to be testing out that experiment on this particular occasion, though at least the manual does go out of its way to point out not to plug the individual wires directly into mains outlets. So at least there is some safety concern. While it certainly feels like this manual was designed to be read through in order to maximize the educational benefit, we're going to go ahead and jump into some later experiments which actually start using that new IC that is the heart of the digital studio. This experiment allows us to connect up the switch to see a basic counting operation. So let's wire this up and give it a go. So we've now wired up this first circuit. It's very important that when we do so, we don't trap the insulation against the rivet in the connector. Instead, we make sure the bare wire is being connected with the rivet. So let's see how I did. Let's go ahead and connect up the battery. On the initial power up, the IAC is in an unknown state and shows the default value of eight on the display. If we press the button, the counter should move into a known state and start advancing. Even though I only press the button once on each occasion, sometimes the counter seemed to advance several more steps. This is due to something known as switch bounce. When we press the button, the contacts don't necessarily open and close cleanly. In fact, they can bounce up and down. Each of these bounces may be detected as an individual switch pulse by the IC, and this means the counter can step forward many times for each button press. To alleviate this problem, we can use a resistor and capacitor, as shown in this diagram here. This allows us to filter out these spurious switch contacts. With any luck, I've correctly wired up this circuit. So let's see how it works. Now, whenever I press the button, the counter reliably counts up by just one each time. As the 74143 is a binary coded decimal or BCD counter, that means the chip counts from 0 to 9 and then resets back to 0 again. But what if we wanted to count to, for example, 5? How would we stop the counter at that point and get it to then reset to 0? Well, that's where having another logic IC like the 7400 might come in. 
By adding in a NAND gate, we can build a programmable counter. So let's build this circuit and see if we can get the counter to stop at 5. So hopefully we've connected up the circuit correctly, but to actually program a programmable counter, we need to choose where to connect our two flying cables to. And that's this lead I have here, which is connected to pin seven on the gate module, and that's wire two. And we have wire one here, which is connected to the resistor. If we want to count up to five, we have to connect cable one to output C, and cable two to output B. So let's connect the power and see what happens. Okay, so our counter still counts, but it stops at five and then resets to zero. So how does this circuit actually work? Well, if we look at the datasheet for the 74143, we can see that the counter value that's being displayed is also output as a binary value on the outputs A, B, C, and D, and these are exposed on our module just here. In our case, we want to count up to five. As this means we want to allow five to be displayed on the screen, we don't want to reset the counter when we get to five. We actually want to reset the counter when we get to six. As a 4-bit binary value, 6 is output as 0, 1, 1, 0. Reading from the right here, what we're looking for is 0, 1, 1, 0. And in this case, we're looking for a 1 on the C and 1 on the B outputs from our IC. We take both of these outputs and feed them as inputs into our NAND gate. Looking at the function table or truth table for our NAND gate, we can see that when both of the input values are high, the output will be low. But in all other cases, the output will be high. Returning to the datasheet for our 74143, we can see there is a clear pin. If we look at the details for the clear pin, when low, this resets and holds the counter at zero, but it must be high for normal counting. This is exactly what's going to happen for us using our NAND gate. You might wonder why there's an additional resistor and capacitor for input six on our NAND gate. The manual goes on to explain this has been inserted into the circuit to alleviate any gate noise or switching delays that might occur when using our counter IC. The manual provides a programming solution for all maximum values except the value 6. This is because if we were looking for a maximum value of 6, what we're actually checking for is to see if the output value is actually a 7 and then we should reset. 7 is a special case because the output value is 0, 1, 1, 1. As you can imagine, that would require three inputs on our NAND gates, but each of our NAND gates only has two inputs. We can, of course, combine the individual NAND gates inside the IC to detect this particular value and reset the counter, and that's explored in the very next experiment. However, if you'd like to learn more about binary and NAND gates, I'd encourage you to watch my video on the Science Fair Electronic Digital Logic Lab Kit. In this video, I explore how the 7400 IC can be used to build a binary counter and even a basic adder, which can be the basis of a computer. However, the manual for the Bush 2075 includes many more experiments to play with. And if you have the 2070 Electronic Studio Kit, you can combine these kits together to explore an additional 15 experiments that are provided in part two of the manual. But for now, I hope you found this video about the Bush Electronic Digital Technology Kit, model 2075, interesting. And I hope to speak to you again soon in the next one.